I am very glad that you're here today, and I am very amped up about preaching today because I get to preach from probably my favorite text in the entire Bible. I have loved going through the eighth chapter of Romans, but we have saved the best for last. Some people would say that Romans is the most important book in the Bible. Most people would say that Romans chapter 8 is the greatest chapter in the book of Romans, and almost everybody would say that those last few verses of the 8th chapter of Romans are the best of all. And I, I don't often ask this of the congregation, but I'm going to ask it of you today in honor of the Word of God. Would you stand up while I read from God's Word today? Romans chapter 8. Beginning in the 35th verse, we read these words. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sore? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, no. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You may be seated. Now if you're going to ask me just in one word what the theme of the 8th chapter of the book of Romans is, I would either pick the word assurance or confidence. Because it seems what Paul is, is driving home after the seventh chapter of, of wrestling with the fact that we are, we are just not who we want to be, that we have assurance through Jesus Christ about our status with God. And he starts out by saying, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say that we don't have a relationship to God like some slave who is in fear of his master. We are, we are sons and we are daughters and we are filled with the Spirit of God so that we can pray, Abba, Father. And we need to pray because this world is full of a lot of Pain And there is a lot of groaning going on. But even when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit steps in and translates our groans to the Father for us. Even as Jesus is in heaven interceding for us. And God is working everything out for our eternal good. Paul wants you to believe this. So for eight weeks, we've gone through Romans 8. But here's the question I want to ask. Has Romans 8 gone through us? Or put it another way, write, write this down. Have I moved from I feel condemned to I am convinced? Has there been a, a movement in your heart and in your spiritual life from that spirit of condemnation to greater confidence and security in God? Because it is easier to assent to theological truth in your head than it is to embrace truth in your heart. And I know in your head, you agree with everything that you have heard as we have gone through the 8th chapter of Romans. But has Romans chapter 8 gone through your heart so that you no longer find yourself drifting back into that spirit of condemnation that is a prison? Because evidence abounds that it is a very hard prison to escape. One proof is our constant drift 
toward man-centered religion. And the appeal of man-centered religion is the false belief that it will provide me with enough to do to convince God that he should be okay with me. So let me ask you a question. When someone asks, how can you know that you're saved? Do you answer in the first person or the third person? Do you answer, I know I am saved because I... Or do you say, because Jesus? Because as long as you answer in the first person, you are going to have a hard time getting out of that prison. I read recently about a preacher that had a desire to raise money for 100 orphans. So he decided that he was going to get sponsors to, to sponsor him and support him as he ran 100 miles. And the last 26 miles were going to be the Chicago Marathon. Now, he was an experienced marathoner, but he did not give his body time to recover, so he ran that first 74 miles. And the night before the marathon, he, he really wasn't feeling very good, but he needed to go and run for those orphans, and he didn't even realize his kidneys were beginning to shut down. So he finishes the race the next day, and he's immediately taken to the medical tent, and they very quickly rush him to the hospital where he spends the next two weeks in the intensive care unit. Now he survived, but as he wrote about this experience a little later, he admits it really was not the orphans that were driving him. It was his addiction to performance. And he said, when I stand before God, God is probably going to say, what were you thinking? I never asked you to do that. How many of us have been killing ourselves spiritually, trying to please a God with a list of rules that he never even asked us to keep? It's because of the spirit of condemnation. Another evidence that prison is hard to escape from. How do you react when devastating things happen, when we realize we live in a fallen world, Paul says there is a lot of groaning going on. So, so when something devastating happens in your life, what is your first thought? It was the seventh week of the 2013 football season. Jermichael Finley tight end for the Green Bay Packers, suffered a bruised spinal cord from a collision on the field that ultimately led to him retiring completely from football. And when he hit the other player from the Cleveland Browns on the field, he immediately collapsed to the ground. He couldn't feel his limbs. He couldn't move. He couldn't even breathe. They put him on a stretcher. They took him to the hospital. Later, he was interviewed, much later actually, by the Sports Illustrated after this injury occurred. And they said, what was, what was the first thought that you had after you realized that you, you couldn't move? Jeremiah Finley responded and said, my first thought was, is God punishing me? Have you ever done that? Have you, have you ever gone through something devastating in your life and you just wondered, is this payback? Am I getting something that I deserve? Paul says, here is the key to freedom. Because that prison that I'm talking about, it's so hard to escape. And, and I'm not sure you're ever going to escape as long as deliverance from that prison depends upon you. As long as it depends on you doing more good things or stopping doing enough bad things. Paul says, here is the key. It is to become convinced of the greatness of the love of God. And it is a conviction that has to be grounded in history. Three chapters earlier, Paul writes, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, 
It wasn't our nature that prompted God. It was His nature. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, the first part of the verse. The apostle says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up His life for us. You see, this love was totally self-initiated. I can trust it because it is not based on my character. It is based on His character. But that requires a, a total transformation of the way that I think about love. Because in my life, I have never experienced completely unconditional love with anybody. And you haven't either. In all of our relationships, there, there is something in us that somebody finds lovely and causes them to invest in us. I can't even fathom a love that is totally self-initiated, that is completely independent of, of anything in me coming to me. That's why it takes illumination from God to trust in the affection of God. In other words, it takes the help of God to believe in the love of God. If you want to escape that prison, you need to start praying, God, help me understand your love, because I don't get it. You might want to pray what Paul prayed in the third chapter of Ephesians, when he said, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and how high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, you may be filled to the full measure of all the fullness of God. That is the essence of who Paul was. His life was grounded. His life was secured. His life was motivated in absolute conviction that God's love was always there for him. So when he says, nothing can separate me from the love of God, he's not talking hypothetically. He isn't a professor in a classroom writing principles up on a chalkboard. He is coming out of his life experiences. This man got beat with a rod three times. He, he got whipped with lashes five times. He, he got stoned once so severely they left him for dead. He was shipwrecked three times. When you go to a different town, you're, you're looking at the hotels, you're looking at the restaurants. When Paul went to a new town, he went and looked at the prison because he was going to end up there at some point. And when Paul says there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God, he is not just talking with his head. It is, it is coming from his heart because the cross had crossed out all doubt about the love of God. God had proved his love. Write this down. God has proved that his love never fails. I, I think one reason we struggle to comprehend this is because, let's be very honest, we, we tend to treat relationships as agreements or exchanges between two parties. I invest in you, and you invest in me because we both believe we're going to get something back. You go to a, a cell phone store. You, you want a cell phone. They want your money. You sign a contract, and that contract says that you're going to get certain services for texting and, and calls and apps, and you're going to give them a certain amount of money. Now, if they don't provide those services, but you get a bill from them, you don't pay that bill. But if they do provide those services, and you don't pay for those services, those services are going to stop. That contract is getting broken. And that is how you and I understand relationships. The, the thing is, God is not contractual. God is covenantal. In other words, God says, this is how I am going to treat you regardless of how you treat me. 
I have performed a lot of weddings, more than honestly I can remember. And every single time, I, I love seeing a couple share their vows with each other. In all of the weddings I have performed, I have never once heard the words, I exchange, I barter with you. I will if you will. But what I have heard is, I promise, I commit, I pledge, I vow. A side note, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says that Christian marriage was God's chosen metaphor to communicate to the world about the fidelity of his love. God's hope was that he could show the world how he loves by, by saying, look at that Christian man, look at that Christian woman. They never break up. I'm never going to break up with you. Sadly, the enemy has destroyed that metaphor today. But what God wants the world to know is, I don't love you if. He wants you to know, I love you even if. You can't do anything to make God love you more than he does right now. And you can't do anything to make him love you less. You might need to make some changes, but it isn't going to change how God feels about you. Jack Benny. Anyone under the age of 40 asked someone older who Jack Benny was. <laughs> when he was a young man, he saw a young woman that he was attracted to, but he was a very shy guy. So he bought her a rose, and he had that rose sent to her. The next day, he did the exact same thing. Day after that, he did the exact same thing. She, she had her curiosity aroused. She went to the floral shop that was delivering these roses, and she asked, who is sending me these roses? They gave her the name and the address. She, she went to him, and she said, why are you sending me roses? And he said, because I'm too nervous to ask you out. So they went out. And they went out again, and they got married, and they stayed married for decades. And every day, she got a rose, and then he died. And that first week, and that second week, and in that third week, she kept getting a rose. So she called the florist. She said, you must not have heard that my husband has passed away. You, you can stop sending flowers. He said, no, ma'am. Your husband made provision before he died that you were to get a rose every single day until you die. The Bible says that the mountains and the hills may crumble, but his love for you will never end. Let me tell you, in, in life, things crumble. Paul, Paul doesn't say, God's love will separate you from hardships and trials. Think, think about it. I mean, how can you be more than a conqueror if there is nothing to conquer? He doesn't say that God's love will separate you from hardship and trial. He says that there is no hardship or trial that can separate you from God's love. Notice that little word in Romans chapter 8, that little word in, I-N. In all these things, we are more than conquerors because in all these things, we experience the love of God in life, in death. Death seems to be like the great separator. It, it separates body and soul. It separates loved ones. And Paul says, even death cannot separate you from the love of of God. The love of God will not rescue you from death. The love of God will raise you from death. And in the moment that you die, do you realize that in that very moment, you are going to have more full understanding of how much God loves you than you have ever had 
here on this earth. Spiritual warfare cannot separate you from the love of God. There are angels and there are demons and they are real and they care about you very much, both for very completely different reasons. And demons are trying to convince you that God has abandoned you. But God's love in Christ is more convincing. Paul says, time cannot separate you from the love of God. Not past, not present, not future can ever change how God feels about you. God is not going to discover something about you and say, Whoa, I didn't know that. There is nothing in the future that is ever going to surprise God that would make him take back his promise. Space cannot separate you from the love of God, not height, not depth. You, you can't go anywhere in the entire universe that is outside of the reach of the love of God. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 33, the latter part of verse 5, the unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. Paul says not, not life, not death, not angels, not demons, not height, not depth, not present, not past, not future. And then he just says, I don't know what else is left, so I'm just going to put it in the box of anything else in all creation is going to be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and you know that in your head. But when is it going to get here? Several years ago, I, I read a story about a little boy in Florida and out behind his house, there was a small lake. It was a hot summer day. He decides he's going to go jump in the lake and go for a swim. He takes his shoes off, takes his shirt off. He jumps into the lake. And his mom is looking out the back window. And she notices this log start to float toward him. But it wasn't a log. And she runs out of her house and she's screaming for her boy to swim to the shore. And just as, she get, as that boy gets to the shore, the alligator gets him. The gator grabs his legs, but his mother grabbed his arms. And a terrible tug of war took place. The alligator had more strength, but the mom had more passion. And for what seemed like an eternity... They were locked in this wrestling match until a farmer who was driving by saw what was happening, grabbed a gun out of his truck, and ran and shot the alligator. They immediately rushed this boy to the hospital where he stayed for several months. When he got to come home, local journalists were doing a story, and there were several cameras, they were all interviewing him. And at one point, one of the journalists asked, can, can we see your scars? little boy rolls up his pant leg and there were the permanent scars that will always be there but then he rolled up his sleeves and there were the scars of the fingernails of a mom who would not let go some of you bear the scars of God he will never disown you, but he will discipline you to pull you away from an enemy that wants to destroy you. And nothing will cause this God to let go of a child that he loves. Now David, he knew about messing up. He messed up a lot. And he would write songs one of the most popular lines in many of David's songs was this line, I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. That's not just in David's head. That was in David's heart. And because he knew that God's love never failed, write this down, God's love always fills. Because of this spirit of condemnation, how many of us have spent way too much of our lives looking for love in all the wrong places? Because we're seeking validation. We, we need somebody to tell us that we matter, that we're significant, that we, we are worth something. 
So we, we go to these idols that just let us down continually. But when God's love becomes your absolute, you do not need a substitute anymore. When you are, when you are rooted in the greatness of His love, you, you don't need props anymore to stand strong. You don't need to conform anymore to expectations. You don't have to change your ethics. You don't have to change your sexuality. You don't have to change your values anymore to get the approval of anybody because before you even got out of bed this morning, you were already the beloved and the blessed and the wonderful child of a loving father. You don't have to kill yourself chasing stuff, thinking if I had just enough valuables, somebody will think I have value. Because the love of God will forever repudiate the lie that your worth is somehow connected to your net worth. When you are grounded in the love of God, you stop getting your identity in performance or appearance. But that decision to trust that love that is a decision you have to remake every day or you're just going to drift back into that prison. I think that is why the brother of Jesus said what he said in the 21st verse of Jude. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. When he says... Keep yourself in God's love. He doesn't mean that you can go somewhere and get out of the love of God. He means to keep your identity, to keep your security, to keep your assurance in the conviction that God loves me. So I'm going to ask you again. Most of you went through Romans chapter 8 with me, but did Romans chapter 8 go through you? Have you made any movement from I feel condemned to I am absolutely convinced? Maya Angelou said as a young woman, she went to San Francisco and she was determined that she was going to be a sophisticated young woman and she found out to be sophisticated, that means you have to be an agnostic. So she became an agnostic. She was taking voice lessons and the teacher asked her to read something and the last sentence that the teacher had asked her to read was the words, God loves me. She finished, and the teacher said, read that last sentence again. So she read it again, rather sarcastically. God loves me. The teacher said, read it again. And I want you to hear in Maya Angelou's own words about the experience. After about the seventh repetition, I began to sense there might be some truth in this statement, that there is a possibility that God really loves me. Maya Angelou, and I suddenly began to cry at the grandness of it all. I knew if God loved me, I could do wonderful things. I could do great things. I could learn anything. I could achieve anything. For what could stand against me with God? One person, any person with God is a majority. You see, God's love never changes, but you will, not, you, but you will change when you become convinced of that. Write, write this down. No separation means no intimidation. That is our big problem. The, the most frequent command in all of the Bible is do not be afraid. We're afraid of what people are going to think about us. We're afraid of the next doctor's report. We're afraid of what the stocks are going to do. But courage comes from being able to trust something that is never going to fail. But on this proposition, you understand in your head, but not all of you understand in your heart. You see, it takes, it takes a certain boldness to be a disciple of Jesus. If you're going to follow in the way of Jesus, you cannot be a coward. Cross-carrying is not for whims. To follow Jesus is to risk 
But on the far side of risk is the confidence that God's love is still holding us. So we don't have to live in the tyranny of timidity. Because if the gospel is true, what do we got to be afraid of? In 2012, a basketball team made the NCAA final tournament, the big dance, they call it. The South Dakota State Jackrabbits. Their coach, Scott Nagy, a believer. In fact, he had adopted a son from Haiti. He does a lot of work with orphans. But, but what got Scott Nagy national attention was his coaching philosophy, his, his team's motto is play like you're loved. You see, Coach Nagy believes no child, no young person should ever think that, that somehow their perfection determines their affection. So he coaches his team to play like they are loved. They've got the big conference final game. If they win this game, they go to the big dance. And here was his speech to his team before that game. I want you to play like you're loved, boys. Play freely. Love isn't dependent on your performance. No matter how you play, you are loved. I know the great commandment is to love God, but I think the best way to love God is to live like you are loved. So, so play like you're loved. Work like you're loved. Go to bed like you're loved. Get out of bed like you're loved. Parent like you're loved. Because to live loved is greatness. Because it takes the help of God to believe in the love of God.